going to uh, look at the questions we were asked, um, particularly uh, how skeptics might view some of the data. And this will be fairly brief. It's not adequate. We should do real justice to people when we uh, interact with them. Obviously, these are only short 20 minute sessions. Uh, and so uh, it's really just a taster of, uh, of how people might I explain things. Now, what I want to do uh, here is I want to um, do a bit of an, a commercial for our uh, free magazine here at Tinder House. It's called Ink. So if we're Tinder House, that's TH, and you add Ink on the end, you get Think. Uh, this is only in its uh, sixth issue. It's only been around for a short time, and it's a free magazine. Uh, so uh, Caspars will be putting the link in the uh, chat. And um, essentially, uh, we are growing this magazine, and it's the only magazine I can think of where you have Bible scholars who have got a positive attitude to the Bible writing with their expertise for lay people at a lay people's level, having been edited people by people who know how to edit to make sure that their uh, manner of speaking is understandable. So uh, I would really strongly recommend that. And in this, I have a four page article looking at the anatomy of how Bart Ehrman's arguments work and some of the um, uh, ideas. It's just a short article, but uh, give you a bit of a sense in that. And there's a link at the bottom of the screen there as well to the particular issue uh, you could uh, read there. What my argument is, is that Bart Ehrman, and I hope most of you uh, have heard of him, uh, I think he's the world's most significant Bible skeptic, he's the world's most capable um, uh, Bible uh, skeptic, um, and most influential I'd say as well. He, he's a very gifted communicator and a knowledgeable person. Um, and when I look at the way he treats the Gospels, there is a scope to his view, uh, which is, it's got many different aspects to it. Um, so that to get all together, his picture just looks very different from what I think is uh, correct. And he's got a number of things I would call distance creators. Effectively, they are ideas that create distance between Jesus and us or Jesus and the gospel writers. Uh, and one of them uh, can be this, that evangelists, the gospel writers, write one thing, but change happens as copyists copy over time. And the way he talks about that is as if that might be significant change. Now on its own, that might not do very much, but then he also has a big distance between Jesus and the gospel writers. Um, and he can, uh, th those are very distinct levels for him. He also has Jesus being a very rural person, country person, and the gospel writers, the evangelists, he would say, seem to be town educated um, at a different social level. They are literary people, otherwise they wouldn't be writing. Uh, books of this length with this much Greek and so on. They're actually of a different social class, a, a higher social class. The, he also says that Jesus speaks basically only Aramaic. That's all he does. But the Gospels are written in Greek. So there's another difference. And of course, none not of these are original to Bart. It's just he brings them all together, Bart Ehrman. Also, he would argue that the disciples of Jesus were illiterate. Uh, literacy rates, he would argue, were very low, and the gospel writers are clearly literate. Therefore, the gospels can't be by the same people who were the illiterate disciples. Um, another distant creator can be oral tradition. And so this is where he does his work on memory, uh, arguing that memory has been shown uh, by these various studies generally to be unreliable, and so he would talk about an oral tradition between Jesus and the Gospels. Um, and you have this period of oral tradition during th which things can be corrupted. And he'll talk about the telephone game where one person says it to another, to another, to another, and it changes. And that's different. And then at the end of that, you have the written source, um, which is really very different from anything in the oral tradition. Jesus is the early first century. I agree with him there. <laughs> um, but then he pushes the Gospels uh, to be pretty late in the first century. Now, I'm not so concerned about 
when the Gospels are written as I am by whom the Gospels are written. Um, so I was meeting with my 100 year old granny yesterday and uh, uh, actually it was the day before yesterday and you know she can remember things. Uh, it's possible for people to have memories of things that are 80 years earlier, 90 years earlier. Um, I'm less concerned about that than I am uh, about um, the um, who wrote the Gospels, uh, where I would say, look, Matthew's Gospel, all the earliest manuscripts have Matthew's name on it as a running header or at the end, they all have that. Or Mark, Luke, John, they all have these names on. So the Gospels may not be dated, but they are named. So Luke's Gospel has to be written during the lifetime, the flourishing lifetime, of someone who could be a companion of Paul in the 50s. Matthew has to be written by someone who could be a tax collector at the time of Jesus. So these are time constraints uh, on when the Gospels are written, unless you're going to suppose they all lived extraordinary lengths of time and only wrote down at the very end of their life. Also, uh, Ehrman would have Jesus in Galilee, that's correct, but the Gospel writers spread throughout the Roman Empire. Now that's fine, um, I also think that three of the four Gospels are probably written outside the land of Palestine. But my argument is whether they were written there or not isn't as relevant as when you look at the content. When you look at the content, the type of material, the type of material is very marked by coming from the land of the story it's about. It's very Palestinian in the geographical sense. And I use the word Palestine uh, because it's been used for that territory back to the time of Herodotus before people started um, getting uh, quite so political about the terminology. Another thing that Ehrman would claim is that the numbers of Christians were really very low. So he thinks that by the year 100, there were only in the entire Roman Empire about 7,000 to 10,000 Christians. And of course, the fewer Christians there are, the fewer people there are passing on uh, the uh, story. And so for me, this is quite striking, given that one of the things that Tacitus says, one of the things that Pliny says, one of the things that the book of Acts says, is the vast numbers of Christians that there were. Um, I think there can be a tendency for people to use models of growth rates, therefore to assume a, a smaller number, when Acts chapter 19 will say, these men are turning the world upside down. They're changing the Ephesian economy. Um, in Acts, it will talk about how many tens of thousands have come to faith uh, in Judea. Uh, this is the, the claim put before Paul. Myriads have come to faith. Uh, so the numbers just go up. Uh, and so I, I, I think that's wrong. And the other thing I think that is implicit in much of what Ehrman says is that Jesus really wasn't a very effective teacher. So I want to argue about against all of those. And the particular one uh, I'm going to take on soon is about Greek. But there's a further aspect I need to touch on, and that is the question of mark and priority. So the common view, uh, the most common view of the order of writing of the Gospels in the early church was Matthew was written first. The most common scholarly view today is that Mark was written first and that probably John was written last. Now, what's my view of that? My answer is I am undeclared as to what I might think about this, but whereas I can accept Mark and priority that Mark came first, Bart Ehrman needs to. It's actually structurally important for him to do so because what that does is it gives him a gospel which doesn't have a birth narrative uh, and, uh, as the earliest. And also, uh, by the way, I've got an um, article in one of the Inc. magazines on Christmas. So Christmas coming up, it may be cancelled this year, but uh, Christmas coming up in some sense uh, soon. And it's on the reliability of um, the birth narratives. Um, Mark also, accepting that it ends at 16 verse 8, has a limited resurrection narrative. So that's convenient for him to say resurrection stories are later. And also, in his interpretation, which I think is a wrong interpretation, it's got, less ex uh, it's got a lower Christology. Now, I would say it's maybe a less explicit high Christology, but it's still got a very high view of Jesus as um, the Son of God. But actually what we find is a lot of skepticism really needs Mark to come first, and that those who are not skeptical can afford to be um, more indifferent about 
the model they use. Now, you, you try and model the literary relationships one way, and it can come out with different views of which order the Gospels were written in. The church fathers generally say they were written in the order Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We can weigh those things differently. I don't think a lot depends on it. Now, one of the things also you have with the common view of the Mark hypothesis is that there is this written source called Q. Q comes from the German word Quelle, meaning source. And so the idea is the Mark is there and Q is also used by Matthew and Luke. And this is a written source and people felt there was confirmation of this because in 1945, when people found uh, the Gospel of Thomas uh, as part of the Nag Hammadi Library, they found a sayings, a, a, a list of a gospel that was a set of sayings of Jesus. And that was to them very much like Q, which they had hypothesized to be a set of sayings. Now, as Mark Goodacre from Duke, who is a brilliant scholar, has pointed out, actually the Gospel of Thomas is nothing like the supposed Q, because uh, Q, the supposed Q has um, chronology. It's got before John the Baptist was arrested and afterwards. It's a very different sort of thing. So, but that's part of the way many people feel that their model has been confirmed. Now I want to come on to evidence that Jesus spoke Greek. Let's remember Jesus is in Nazareth, which is on the brow of a hill overlooking the Jezreel Valley, which is the big um, east-west route for trade from um, the Far East. I mean, if you want to get basically to Africa from Asia, the Jezreel Valley is a good place to go. So it's not um, j just a couple of miles away from Jesus' village, down the, down the hill, pe people are traveling, it's, it's pretty big. Um, and so he's, he's not just in a backwater culturally. The other thing is we know, uh, according to Matthew's gospel, that his family spent some time down in Egypt. Now what language they speak in Egypt? Well, they can speak Egyptian, they also speak Greek. And I would have thought if Joseph and Mary really did spend time in uh, Egypt, then they would have needed to learn some Greek. So that's an interesting bit. Um, Joseph apparently ran a trade as a carpenter. And do you think he only did w um, contracts for, uh, for Aramaic speakers? Well, 3.7 miles away from Nazareth or so is Sepphoris, um, the Greek speaking city, one of the most important cities in Galilee. It's got a Greek theater where there were actors who would be called hypocrites, hypocrites, um, that uh, Jesus would have grown up uh, knowing about that, where um, plays would be put on in Greek uh, within just over an hour's walk from where uh, Jesus grew up. And uh, Jesus and his father were carpenters, which really means construction uh, workers, and the biggest building pr uh, projects in the area were at Sepphoris. So uh, he then moved to Capernaum and he chose a um, set of disciples. Um, and in his center group, he had uh, uh, Peter and uh, James and John, and Peter had a brother called Andreas, Andrew, which is a wonderful Greek name, which his parents had given him. So this idea that there was no Greek around, we got Greek gospels, we have Greek uh, speaking synagogues uh, in um, Jerusalem, uh, that's talked about in the book of Acts. Andrew and Philip from Bethsaida, also Peter's, if I can, uh, sorry, Jesus's number one disciple, Peter, by the way, he's called Peter far more often than Cephas in, in the New Testament, um, also comes from Bethsaida, that Greek city. Uh, Philip, probably named after uh, Philip, uh, uh, the, uh, who, after whom Bethsaida was named. Uh, Jesus interacts with Herod, uh, sorry, Nicodemus. Herod is the in charge at the time. I love Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus the beggar, whose grandparents probably liked Plato. Think about it, um, because grandfather calls son Timaeus, and therefore grandson is Bar, Aramaic for son, Bar Timaeus. That's how linguistically mixed up things were. Why have people accepted the idea that people only spoke Aramaic in Palestine? Basically, they accepted it 
before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, back in the 19th century, at, at the height of the Romantic movement, where it was lovely to try and create this wonderful Hebraic, Aramaic, Semitic Jesus, uncorrupted by nasty Greek philosophy of Plato and Aristotle and the rest of the villains, okay? And you could get back to that human spirit, uh, the original inspiration, and what they could do is this idea that Jesus was just a poet. I mean, Herder would love this, who, who could come out uh, with this brilliant expression. That was the way people like to think. And it's not driven by the data. There's plenty of evidence for Greek speaking, Greek written on the coins, uh, Greek inscriptions all around the place. The Sanhedrin, the main um, Jewish body meeting together has the Greek name Sunhedrion, and Jesus is an itinerant speaker. He goes to every village. Well, hang on. Does he just go to the uh, Aramaic speaking ones and not to the rest? He sends his disciples out to every village. You then encounter people. If you are a part of a family that goes up every year to Jerusalem, you go with a whole load of other traveling pilgrims, most of whom they're tourists, don't speak the local language, much more likely to speak Greek. You're coming across people speaking Greek, bumping into them all the time. Jesus has a conversation with a Syrophoenician woman who is said to be a Greek. Presumably he spoke Greek to her. In fact, there's this wonderful bit in John's Gospel where people are wondering about what Jesus is going to do next and they say, hey, is he going to go off and teach the Greeks? Well, they wouldn't say that if Jesus couldn't speak Greek. Now for some more concrete evidence for Jesus actually speaking Greek, looking at what's called the Sermon on the Mount. But beware of that, because it's not a sermon, it's a lesson. Now, uh, because it says at the beginning, not Jesus got up and spoke this speech, it's that he taught them. He was sitting down and he taught them, saying. So this is actually a lesson, which means that anything that, he, that is recorded in Matthew 5 to 7 could have been said repeatedly over a, the period of a day. Um, uh, Bart Ehrman says, to have that correctly recorded, you've got to have people with this ridiculously good memory because they have to memorize everything but hang on if you came up with something as brilliant as the beatitudes you might well repeat them you might well get your disciples to learn them the lord's prayer is probably something they memorize so actually it's not that they have to memorize a speech in one go it's that he has used this speech in many places but here we have the sermon on the mount what's called the sermon on the mount and this is the opening in greek sorry it's i'm going to give you the greek but what i want you to see here is how it begins in matthew chapter 5 and i show you the greek so that you can see the verse 3 blessed are the poor in spirit now notice poor begins with the letter pi that's that first green and this word spirit pneuma also begins with the letter pi and the next three beatitudes also begin with pi those who mourn penthuntes the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The first four begin with pi, and the first two of them have pi quite a lot. Those who mourn will be comforted. And this is the way it begins. Now, you have a choice. You can say Jesus taught this, in which case it would be memorable, or you can say Jesus taught somewhere different, like he taught in Aramaic or Hebrew, and then someone translated it. But if they translated it, it wouldn't come out like this. Because if you turn this back into Hebrew or Aramaic, and I've done that, you don't get alliteration, however you try. Maybe a bit of the letter I in, if you like, between numbers one and three, but not a lot. So when we look at this, we see alliteration, but it's not just that. Then we see those who hunger and thirst, this is verse six, for righteousness. And the word thirst begins D-I, and the word righteousness begins, D-I. In verse eight, those who are pure in heart. The word pure is katharoi, like Catherine, named pure, and cardia, like the word cardiologist. Uh, it's for heart, pure in heart, it's alliterated. Those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, in verse 10, the word persecuted has got D-I in and another D, and then that comes up in righteousness again. Then we look at Verse seven, where that is the blessed are those who are merciful, shall they shall obtain mercy. Well, that's got repeated 
repetition of the same element within both. Then in verse 9, we have, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, we're able to reconstruct a lot more about Hebrew, um, Greek pronunciation now, based on how people spell things, misspell things, and so on. And most scholars now think that in the time of Jesus, the ending of the peacemakers as oi oi was actually u u. And that is actually also how you'd say the word sons. So every single beatitude has word, uh, words sounding similar. It has assonance. Jesus teaches these to be memorized and they are very memorable. Also, the second half of each of Beatitudes begins, the first and the last have for theirs, and the middle ones have for they. And I want you to notice that in Greek, the first and the last are only two letters different, and all the rest are the same. If you try and do that in Hebrew and Aramaic, you will not get that much similarity, because you'll need to do first a relative pronoun, then you'll need to do a resumptive pronoun on the first and last and it's just going to look very very different this works in greek in fact in greek there are different ways of doing plurals and uh, of doing verbs here's the verbs at the end um they end with the uh, five of them end with the same five letters and four of them uh, with the same eight letters the plurals we can see in blue all of the plurals ending in s come are clustered together and the plurals beginning with an O-I, uh, that, uh, ending with an O-I, they come at the beginning and at the end. Everything is beautifully structured, plus it's full of Old Testament references. So someone, whoever comes up with this, has to be very good at Greek oratory and know the Old Testament really well. This is super smart. Uh, and, and I don't know of any Jewish writer who comes up with anything quite this good. Um, and then how's the Sermon of the Mount end? Well, there are many things. I could give long talks on the Sermon on, on the Mount or what's called that. But one of the things it says is beware, and the word is pros echete, of those who are false prophets, and pseudo is false, and then propheton is prophet, who come to you in the clothing of sheep, probaton. And this is a brilliant, memorable saying. And most of the rest of the speech is like that, or, or the lesson is like that as well. It's designed like that. And so this is the way Jesus teaches. Now you might say, well, how, how could he speak in Greek? Look at this. Who is supposed to be the audience? It says great crowds followed Jesus. This is just before the so-called Sermon on the Mount from Galilee, the Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Well, what common language do they all speak? Uh, the people in the Decapolis, the 10 cities, the Decapolis, they are Greek speakers. Now, this is the sad thing that happens. I like languages, but when you, um, as an English speaker, when I go abroad um, and there's a crowd of English speakers, we all just tend to end up speaking English and we're doing a seminar in English. It just happens. Um, it would be like that for people from the Decapolis. Wherever they went, people would end up adapting to their Greek language. They're not going to be expected to learn Aramaic. So in fact, would it be more likely that this lesson was given in Greek than in Aramaic? Of course. So I think Jesus, he's a brilliant uh, teacher. That's an understatement. Of course, he can teach in Aramaic uh, and in, in, in Greek. Um, so it's not a sermon, it's a lesson which is taught. And that's a big difference uh, as, as to how we view it. And of course, that means there's a lot more case for why we can, we can get the information correctly handed down over a long period. And so that actually takes out a significant block. And what I'd say is each of the different blocks we can actually go through. Now, I want to look at an objection to this. And that is, well, okay, that's just Matthew's spin on it. But surely it wasn't like that. And anyway, there's a similar sermon over in, Math in Luke. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, let's go to the sermon in Luke, Luke chapter 6, sometimes called the Sermon on the Plain. Now, some people would have them being the same sermon because you can have a plateau 
on a mountain, and so it can be a level area as well as a mountain, or I would say, um, this could be Jesus's set piece sermon that he uses quite a bit. And so uh, it, it's not that it was repeated twice, he probably used it 20 times. But anyway, I've certainly used some of my talks that many times. Um, but what I want you to notice about this is that in Luke's version, you don't have eight Beatitudes like in Matthew, you have four blessings and then four woes. But what I want you to notice is the pie alliteration happens in the woes which aren't in Matthew. And this is just brilliant. So you've got one way of saying the word but, or well, you've got more than one way of saying the word but, he uses the one, the word but in verse 24, which is the one with a P, woe to you rich, for you have had your comfort. That's verse 24. Woe to you have been fulfilled, and words for filling often in many languages begin with the letter P. So we've got that word, the repeated P there in verse 25. Um, and th that again is, um, just very characteristic of the letter P, you've had, uh, you, you won't be hungry. Uh, woe to you who laugh, you will weep. And then we end up with a super set of P's at the end. Now this is really interesting. Um, Matthew has his P's most clustered at the beginning of the blessings. Luke only has, or has the P's most clustered at the end of the woes. Now, let's think of hypotheses to explain this. One hypothesis could be that Matthew invented lots of alliteration with letter P, and Luke invented lots of alliteration with the letter P. Eh, that doesn't really explain them very much. But if we suppose that maybe they copied a source, let's not call it Q, let's call it P, the P source. And actually, there's something that goes back earlier than them. That is the memory of Jesus, the record of what Jesus actually said. That's a situation in which we can easily explain this sort of thing. So for me, the question of whether it is one sermon or two is a little bit less interesting because I don't think of them as a sermon so much as a lesson. And I think of Jesus as a repeating teacher. Um, but I do think that as a teacher, he wanted people to learn his sayings, we sometimes see the disciples discussing the meaning of what was that thing he was just saying. So that's the way I'd look at it. Now we're going to have to um, uh, come to another question session. And so I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we'll look at some uh, questions. There's a quote from Jerome's uh, Life of Indust Illustrious Men where he says that the original Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew and that the copy was left in the library at Caesarea. What do you make of that? And I'd say, why not? Um, quite reasonably to be true. So Matthew's job is a tax collector and you have to write a bit for that. I mean, particularly write money receipts. Don't pay tax without asking for a receipt. Um, it'd be crazy to do that. You actually want to walk away with a piece of writing saying you have paid your money. Just bear that in a lesson for life. So we have records of tax receipts, not from Palestine because things don't tend to survive there, but from Egypt, yes. So he has to write, and I guess he has to interact with people and write, uh, be involved writing the languages uh, that uh, they need. Now that's not high level literacy, that's a, a basic um, functional uh, literacy. So, um, but I, I don't see a reason why um, Matthew can't write both in Hebrew, probably meaning Hebrew, not Aramaic, uh, and and in Greek, people can have that level of literacy. People often use models to work out how much someone could know, but those models often don't work because they are working a priori as to how much someone is allowed to know. Um, and people, there are often exceptions. That's how things like the X Factor, Britain's Got Talent and so on work because they take someone who by the actuarial standards shouldn't be able to do what they can do and yet they can do it. Um, so I, I, I've no re, uh, reason to think that Matthew couldn't do a Hebrew and a Greek edition of his work, just as, by the way, Josephus did an Aramaic and a Hebrew, uh, Aramaic and a Greek edition of his Jewish war. Um, and by the way, the, the record of a Hebrew gospel is only for Matthew, it's not for Mark, Luke and, and John. How much has your knowledge and deeper study of the Old Testament references enriched your theology 
work over the years. Could you expound its influence on your personal convictions? Uh, I was had the privilege of being uh, brought up uh, by wonderful parents in a Christian family. Uh, and um, I think my brother's on the line, so hi, Tim. Um, and uh, it, it's been a, a, a great privilege. And of course, the, the Bible is integrated. The Old Testament is essential to uh, understand the New Testament. And Jesus was a great enthusiast for uh, the Old Testament. And if you really want to get good at grasping the New Testament, study the Old. Uh, and we're going to do a bit of study of the Old in the last session. Uh, how do you consider Chris Keith's hypotheses that Jesus is basically not able to write? So what Chris, Chris Keith says in his book, Jesus Literus, Jesus's Literacy, um, uh, is he says it's the first investigation anyone's ever done of Jesus's uh, literacy. And um, he actually early on in the book, he says, I'm, I, um, the, 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 the supernatural Christological questions about who Jesus is are, are not relevant. Well, I think they're highly relevant. I, I really disagree with that. Um, but he has this argument that we should look at who Jesus is through the memories of how people have remembered him. And he says uh, that he was remembered by some people as belonging to the scribal class, uh, but that wasn't actually the way scribes remembered him and others. So, uh, and he says there's also a memory of him not being in the scribal class, and that's how he tries to work at it. I find the approach too a priori, um, too modern based, rather than actually looking at, uh, I think, more natural interpretations of the data or the claims. I would make claims is a better word than data here, the claims of the Gospels. Um, so I, I, I think we're just starting in a very different way. I'd love to have a conversation with, with Chris, Chris about that uh, fascinating book. I've often wondered about the two accounts of the death of Judas in Matthew 25 and Acts 1. I remember Bar I'm impressing you on the alleged discrepancy between two accounts of the hanging and falling headlong with associated spillage of intestines. I note the ambiguity of the language in Esther, where it seems that impaling may be in mind rather than hanging. Uh, might this be a resolution of the Judas question? I'd need to do more lexicographical work on the Greek word in Matthew. I uh, had a debate with Bart Ehrman and this, this came up and I made a mistake of English by thinking the word headlong meant head down. And we both used that in the debate and it was wrong. Headlong means, um, can mean horizontal. Uh, and so there's nothing in Acts account of uh, what uh, ha happens that is against the idea that, that uh, Judas uh, uh, simply hanged uh, himself. So I will um, say a little bit more about the final session in contradictions. What about portions of the Gospels for which the earliest extent, uh, manuscripts date from, say, AD 200 or later? Can the skeptics say we can't know whether or not important changes were deliberately induced? Great question. But let's just think about the situation of Calvin, Luther, whoever it is, 500 years ago, their earliest manuscripts were the 12th century. Erasmus's earliest manuscripts were the 12th century. So this is the really ironic thing. As the gap between the earliest manuscripts and the Gospels, the time of events, is getting narrower, people are getting more skeptical. <laughs> uh, because people trusted for years. And uh, so that's one answer. Another answer is this. We've had 500 years of discovery of manuscripts. If the manuscripts we discover, say in the next 500 years, if there is the next 500 years, are anything like the ones discovered in the last 500 years, then they're going to be giving increasing precision to what we know about the text of the New Testament, not changing anything. However, we have here the question of proof. If you had a photo of Moses coming down the Mount Sinai with the tablets, from God. You still couldn't prove he hadn't changed them before he came down round the corner. In other words, no amount of evidence will ever be enough for a skeptic. There will always be a gap. The problem is there is always that gap in everything they do. And skeptics aren't really consistent skeptics. They're selective skeptics. They choose to apply a different set of criteria to gospel things, to what they do, elsewhere and they don't question 
everything quite as much. They don't question their own um, morality uh, quite as much. I mean, you know, the most honest ones are folk like Nietzsche, um, uh, who, who, who questions everything. Um, but actually, a lot of people uh, don't do that. So uh, I would say that um, th we really we shouldn't ex uh, expect that any new discovery is going to um, change big, cause a big upset. And I do go uh, I make that argument more formally in chapter six of my little book, um, where I talk about how little has actually changed in the last 500 years. Is it possible uh, that if the disciples start out as illiterate, may have become literate over time? Um, um, that, that is possible. I mean, it depends what you think Jesus's job as a teacher was to do. Um, I mean, most teachers would have taught people uh, to write. Uh, and I think there's a tendency uh, to, to read and write. And we, we tend to think of Jesus as just a moral teacher, um, nothing, nothing more. Uh, and, and I don't think we have enough data uh, to answer that. But I don't see a reason why they can't learn, or, uh, uh, learn that uh, on their own. And uh, the other thing is, Peter doesn't need to write, he can have someone pen it themselves. You don't need actually to pick up the pen and write yourself. Um, so, um, but also what can people learn over time? Rabbi Akiba was a shepherd, yet he managed to become highly literate. So yes, it can happen. Greetings, uh, I have doubt on John 7, 38. Uh, what Old Testament is Jesus referring to? He says, as the scripture says, doesn't he? In John 8, 38, 7, 38. Um, so what he does is um, in, uh, I'll just read it out. John 7, 38, he says um, about he, um, this, uh, who, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his belly. Now, I think there's uh, not, it's not saying as a particular text says and then quotation um but i think it's a reference to ezekiel chapter 47 where jesus is um fulfilling the temple and in john's gospel when he's crucified blood and water come from his side and from the side of the temple in uh uh ezekiel 47 the water comes which flows and brings life